Um, again, so for those of you attending tonight's session online, we are recording tonight's session. Uh, if you do not wish to appear on the recording, either on voice or video, all that you have to do is make sure that your audio and video are disabled. Um, anything you put into the chat will not appear on the recording. So just wanted to let you know about that. Sylvia, go ahead and take it away. Okay, well, uh, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Today we have Dr. Francis Galan, who is an Associate Professor of History of Texas at uh, Texas A&M University, San Antonio, where he teaches courses in history of Texas, Mexico, and Latin America. He has also taught previously at UTSA and Our Lady of the Lake University. Dr. Galan received his PhD in history from South, uh, Southern uh, Methodist University in Dallas and an MA in history from UTSA and a BA in Latin American studies from the University of Texas at Austin. His book, Los Andes, the first capital of Spanish Texas was published in 2020 by Texas A&M University Press and is a finalist for the Ramirez Family Award for the most significant scholarly book from the Texas Institute of Letters. Among Dr. Galan's research interests are questions that revolve around the formation of borderlands, trade, and identity. He is originally from South Texas and is married to Dr. Emma Mata Galan from Laredo. And together they have two children, Nicolas and Madison. So now I am going to turn it over to Dr. Uh, Galan. All right, thank you very much, uh, Celia, for that wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen with you here. And so you should be able to see that now. I'm gonna go ahead and make that a little bit uh, larger here. And so you should be able to see that in a larger screen view. Hello, I am honored and privileged to participate in the 10th annual Holocaust Learn and Remember series hosted by the San Antonio Public Library and this year's theme of immigration and refugees. This presentation focuses on Sephardic Jewish history that is largely overlooked in the Spanish conquest of the Americas and our own identity as Hispanics today. On March 31st, 1492, King Ferdinand and, Isa and Queen Isabella issued the Edict of Expulsion, expelling all practicing Jews from the Spanish kingdoms of Aragon and Castile. Jews had four months to leave Spain or stay behind and convert to Christianity. Out of a total population of approximately 300,000 Jews, around 100,000 fled and another 200,000 converted. The image on this slide depicts such an exodus for Jews who had been in medieval Spain before the Roman, Visigoth, and Arab conquests of the Iberian Peninsula. And so some of the questions we consider for this presentation is why expel the Jews? Where did they go? Who were some of these so-called crypto or hidden Sephardic Jews? What impact did the Mexican Inquisition have upon society? And lastly, the significance of learning about Sephardic Jewish history. There are long-term and short-term causes that contributed to the expulsion of Jews from Spain. These include going back to the late Roman Empire and its conversion to Christianity, including the conversion to Christianity of the Visigoths after they had invaded uh, the Iberian Peninsula. There are also reasons of political and economic instability, basically prior to the 200 years prior to 1492. And to keep in mind that it's not just in Spain, but also that Jews had been expelled from England in 1290 and from France, 1306. And so this really reflects a broader anti-Semitism across Europe as well as Spain. And then 
uh, the bubonic plague or black death of the mid 14th century that was blamed upon Jews. And hence you get this expression of uh, cochino marranos or dirty Jews that comes about marrano being a Spanish word for a uh, pig. But also in the Reconquista, the long Reconquista by Christians against Arab rule in Spain, in which you have Jews essentially caught in the middle and no longer to play off both sides, no longer to, to hide under Arab rule of what's left of Arab rule by 1492. And then lastly, the unification of Spain, these various Christian kingdoms, especially following the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella in 1469, and the fall of Granada in January, January 1st to be exact, 1492, which ended uh, Arab rule of Spain. And so these causes also reveal the ebb and flow of violent conflict that have overlapped with the notion of convivencia or peaceful coexistence among Jews, Christians, and Muslims in Spain. The term sefardim which includes those Jews expelled from Spain and their descendants over the past 500 plus years comes from the Hebrew word for, for Spain, uh, Sefarar. In her book, The Jews of Spain, History of the Sephardic Experience, scholar Jane Gerber states, at the heart of Sephardic self-definition lies the memory of a Jewish golden age of philosophy, poetry, and science in 10th and 11th century Andalusia, that predates the Spanish golden age by 500 years. Gerber adds that Sefarad also denotes the reality of a degree of integration unknown elsewhere in medieval times. Only in modern Germany and the United States have the surrounding cultures been as beckoning to the Jew. Sephardic Jewry is unique in that it emerged from the fusion of several civil civilizations that included the major faiths of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. However, as you see uh, depicted in this image, the formal establishment of the Holy Office of the Inquisition in 1478, which was meant to stamp out heresy and to rid Jews of uh, Spain of Jews, reflected this crusading zeal of conformismo or conforming to the majority, along with the Reconquista, especially since the 11th century. Growing intolerance included such restrictive laws as Christians and Jews forbidden from living or eating among each other, a ban against intermarriage between Christians and Jews, the wearing of a distinctive Jewish badge, a particular garment, whether robe or hat, usually of a yellow color, and Jews forbidden to carry Christian names. Also, Pogroms and anti-Jewish riots across Spain in the late 14th century evoke images of the horrific Kristall Night or Night of the Broken Glass in Nazi Germany of the 20th century. And so fear of religious persecution, being tortured and burned alive, not surprisingly, drove thousands of Jews into exile from Spain across the world. And for those Sephardic Jews who fled Spain, there were two major migration routes after 1492. One was eastward under the Ottoman Empire, where, for example, they were welcomed in Istanbul in modern Turkey, but also to Northern Europe, especially Amsterdam. And you'll also notice on the screen that there's an arrow pointing to the Americas as well as to Northwestern Africa. For those who headed to the Americas, it meant leaving the Spanish Portuguese borderlands of Western Iberia, where many Jews sought refuge time and time again until Portugal also expelled Jews in 1497. So the exodus became periodic in response to political and economic cycles in Europe. And from the borderlands in Western Iberia, they traveled to the Canary Islands, from the Canary Islands to Havana, Cuba, from uh, Havana to Veracruz, Mexico, or from Havana to Cartagena de Indias, which is modern Colombia, as well as Jews who traveled to the Portuguese colony of Brazil. Jews also went to the colonies of Spain's European competitors. 
especially the island of Curaçao, which is a Dutch colony in the Caribbean near the coast of Venezuela and engaged in a lot of contraband trade uh, in that borderlands, if you will, but also the island of Jamaica in the Caribbean, which was a formerly Spanish, Jamaica, which is actually a, a fruit drink in, in the modern day, um, but then uh, taken by the English. And of course, also uh, Jamaica became a center of contraband trade in the New World, as well as New Amsterdam, which was the Dutch colony later taken uh, and becoming New York after the Anglo-Dutch Wars of the late 17th century. We just don't know the exact number of Jews who lived in the Americas, particularly because they mostly kept any semblance of Jewish culture secret. Following their arrival in Mexico, Sephardic Jewish history can be divided into three periods, from the discovery to the conquest, 14... 1519, from 1519 until the establishment of the Inquisition Tribunal in New Spain or colonial Mexico in 1571, and from 1571 to 1810, during which the tribunal functioned. There were also two kinds of so-called conversos, Christians of Jewish ancestry who arrived in the New World, first Christ, uh, Christ, uh, crypto or hidden Jews, also derogatorily called maranos, who continued their tradition in secret and looked for a better economic situation and a way to evade persecution of the Inquisition's tribunal. The other group were those who genuinely converted and assimilated, but hid their origin and blood impurity. One of the best secondary works on the topic of Sephardic Jews in New Spain is scholar David Gitlitz's book, Living in Silverado. Secret Jews in the Silver Mining Towns of Colonial Mexico, published in 2019. And so you had a couple of ways that went to Mexico. Uh, the first wave in the 1530s, not long after the, con uh, the conquest over the Aztecs in Tenochtitlan, as well as a larger wave that came later in the uh, 16th century, especially after the political union of Spain and Portugal in 1580. And so Gitlet looks at individual uh, Sephardic Jews who moved into the mining region north of Mexico City, including one Thomas de Fonseca, who was a miner. And in the case of Thomas de Fonseca, who was trying to uh, make a living at silver mining, um, he got into a legal dispute with a miner who lived just above, a little higher from his uh, piece of land. And uh, there was uh, a legal battle over uh, access to water, and he was accused of being Jew. And so it was a way of trying to uh, get at a competitor uh, by accusing them of uh, Jewry. And you have, especially in that larger second wave, um, a movement even further into northeastern uh, New Spain or colonial Mexico and the establishment of Nuevo León. And so Gitlitz notes how during the first 50 years of colonization in Mexico, there's little evidence of any community of Judaizers and that by the early 1580s, after that political union of Spain and Portugal, communal Judaizing became possible with the appearance of greater numbers of conversos, many in family groups. Among the surnames of those who arrived in 1580 and organized into an expedition under Governor Luis de Carvajal y de la Cueva were Nunez, Matos, De Leon, Perez, Morales, Muñoz, Enriquez, and later that same decade, other Sephardic surnames, including Mendez, Rodriguez, Fernandez, and Lopez. Meanwhile, the Spanish Inquisition expanded with branches established in 1570 in Lima, Peru, 1571, as we noted, in Mexico City, which also exercised jurisdiction over Spain's Asian colonies because it's too easy to forget that you had the connection between the port of Acapulco and the establishment of Manila in the Philippines, as well as in 1610 in Cartagena de Indias, as we mentioned, modern. Colombia. Across the Spanish Empire, Judaizing conversos were being arrested, tortured, their property seized, and some publicly burned or in effigy. 
Among the alleged Judaizing activities, for example, that Tomás de Fonseca was charged with included sometimes observing the Sabbath, making certain his house, table, bed linen, and his body were clean, observing Yom Kippur and the fast of Esther, as well as having his meat slaughtered and trimmed in the kosher fashion. One witness said he never saw Fonseca eat a piece of salted pork. To escape persecution in central Mexico, many conversos sought refuge on its northeastern frontier in what became the province of Nuevo León, pioneered under Luis de Carvajal. And uh, Carvajal's uh, father had come from the uh, Portuguese Spanish borderlands in western Iberia. He had come to the New World through the route that I had mentioned in the previous slide. And it's interesting that you had many Sephardic Jews who had settled in and around Monterrey, Nuevo León, and how Carvajal then essentially would have blazed this trail of settlement into northeastern New Spain along what we know familiarly in Texas as the Camino Real. And this extended into Texas and to northwestern Louisiana, which became known as El Camino Real de Tierra Afuera, or land to the outside. And basically that route, and you see it depicted in the, uh, in the map here, you had three principal, principal routes to Northern New Spain. The first one was the central corridor that went all the way up to San, Santa Fe, New Mexico. The one to the Northeast that went all the way, as I mentioned, into uh, Northwestern Louisiana. And then one later in the late 18th century that went all the way up into Alta California or Upper California, all the way up to San Francisco. Other conversos traveled even further north to New Mexico into the Spanish borderlands, a term historian Herbert Bolton applied to the northward expansion of Spanish colonies from the Caribbean and Mexico into what is the southern third of the present United States from Florida to California. Bolton, a history professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the early 20th century, was a student of Frederick Jackson Turner, who developed the famous frontier thesis of American westward expansion. Based off the notion of settlement in stages by pioneers of an era of free land that in turn shaped the democratic and individualistic character of the United States. Mexico's far northern frontier, on the other hand, did not have as great an influence upon the Mexican nation because the master narrative of Mexico remained with the Spanish conquest by Hernán Cortés over the Aztecs and the destruction of their capital at Tenochtitlan, upon which Mexico City was subsequently built and made the center of viceregal power in New Spain. To the Spanish, the north remained a region where the Indios Bárbaros, or savages, lived. And if these uncivilized people would not submit to Spanish rule and convert to Christianity, they would be killed and or taken into captivity for mining and agricultural operations to the south in New Spain, or even beyond into other parts of the Spanish empire. And so you have then, in this case, seeing the central corridor of the Camino Real going all the way to Northern New Mexico and having passed through El Paso del Norte on the way to the North in 1598. And then the establishment of the town of Santa Fe in 1610 by Juan de Oñate and his expedition, among whom there were uh, uh, Sephardic Jews. And so then uh, you have then uh, the long arm of the Mexican Inquisition, which made its way even to New Mexico and prosecuted individuals accused of being secretly Jewish. New Mexico, of course, was home to Pueblo Indians already accustomed to living in settled towns and whom Franciscans believed were ripe for conversion because they did not need to be gathered from the wilderness into the Spanish missions. For me, um, going to New Mexico includes going northern New Mexico to visiting, for example, the Taos Pueblo, where on the, uh, you, you will see in the Taos Pueblo a Catholic church prominently as you enter the uh, Pueblo settlement. And so that for the Pueblos, 
they are uh, Christian on Sunday, but then for the rest of this, the other six days of the week, they are Pueblo. And so you can imagine my pleasant surprise when I traveled with my wife and children to Santa Fe in late December 2016 and was able to visit this absolutely wonderful exhibit called Fractured Faiths, Spanish Judaism, the Inquisition, and New World Identities. The best work on the story of the crypto Jews of New Mexico is historian Stanley Hord's book, To the End of the Earth, A History of the Crypto Jews of New Mexico, published by Columbia University 8 press in 2008. And Dr. Hordes served on the committee that was behind this exhibit. And so when you walk through those doors, you end up seeing on the first panel the names of six individual Sephardic Jews. And underneath each of them, they had their own key, which would you, you would use to unlock a box that would, un, that would unveil the story of their individual lives. And so for me, um, I looked at the one that's listed here second, which was Doña Teresa Aguilera y Roche, uh, because she ended up in New Mexico. She was uh, born in Italy around 1623. Uh, she had gone to New Mexico uh, because she was the wife of the colonial governor there, Don Bernardo Lopez de Mendizabal. And so then the question that was asked was, how did this highly educated and well-to-do lady cope with being imprisoned? And so you can see from this slide um, on the left-hand side that uh, she had married uh, Lopez uh, while um, her father was governor of Cartagena de Indias in modern Colombia. And so that uh, Lopez had been on the Spanish treasury fleet and basically traveling from uh, Spain to uh, Havana and from Havana going to Cartagena, but then also going to Veracruz and Mexico and eventually going on to Santa Fe. And even in New Mexico, Doña Teresa and her husband were accused of being secretly Jewish and they were arrested. In, the, in August 1662. They appeared for the hearing before the Inquisition in Mexico City. And it's interesting that in the case of Doña Teresa, uh, she was accused of 47 crimes against the Catholic Church, including skipping mass, mocking religious traditions, practicing occult rituals, and secretly being Jewish. In her defense, she said that she missed mass only when her arthritis acted up and she just couldn't move. She said that the occult rituals were really nothing more than just herbal remedies that she needed for her many illnesses. In other words, that they would really have been indigenous uh, remedies. And so she ended up uh, contesting uh, this by saying as well that it was her enemies, political enemies that were out to get her husband and her. But it's important to note that this only added to societal conflicts in New Mexico, especially between the governor and missionaries, which contributed to the Great Pueblo Revolt in 1680 that resulted in a brief 12 year Pueblo independence from Spanish rule until the Reconquista of New Mexico uh, by Spain in 1692, undertaken by Diego de Vargas after having been appointed governor of New Mexico and leading a military expedition. And so then the Mexican Inquisition had a direct impact upon society in colonial Mexico among just what you can imagine in terms of uh, being tortured and burned alive, um, families being destroyed, just the sheer fear and anxiety that the institution is present and suspicion on the part of neighbors. And if I'm not mistaken, the image on the right is artwork uh, from a mural by Diego Rivera, uh, certainly Mexico's most famous artist, along with his wife and fellow artist Frida Kahlo. And it's, uh, and it's painted in the kind of uh, um, style of Diego Rivera. And so then 
one of the most comprehensive works on the Mexican Inquisition is historian Maria Elena Martinez's book, Genealogical Fictions, Limpieza de Sangre, Religion and Gender in Colonial Mexico, published by Stanford University Press in 2008. She examines the rise of categories of limpieza de sangre or purity of blood in late medieval Castile and its export to the Americas, where Martinez argues it eventually took on a life of its own and produced by the 17th century, a hierarchical system of classification in Spanish America known as the Sistema de Castas or caste system, ostensibly based on proportions of Spanish, indigenous, and African ancestry a category Spaniards first deployed against Jewish converts to Christianity, the conversos or, or new Christians. She states that by the middle of the 16th century in Spain, descent and religion, blood and faith were two foundations of an ideology based on only having Christian ancestors and thus pure lineage, which would become true in Spanish America. Blood purity in Spain meant the absence of Jewish and heretical antecedents that by the mid 15th century saw conversos increasingly deprived access to certain institutions and public and private offices, especially after the founding of the Spanish Inquisition, which also was extended to descendants of Muslims and referred to as Moriscos, Christians of Islamic origin. The process of rooting out secret Jews on both sides of the Atlantic included the so-called autos de fe, which were public, sometimes private, acts of religious penance. Public autos, Martinez notes, became elaborate spectacles involving inquisitors, royalty, and large audiences, featured a procession to the square and stage where they were held, a mass and a sermon and a reading of the crimes of the accused. All this culminated with reconciliation of the sinners with the church and with penalties that included confiscation of belongings, long-term imprisonment, work in the galleys, and the wearing of so-called San Benitos, those yellow penitential garments mentioned earlier, with a black St. Andrew's cross drawn on them. The burning of heretics, meanwhile, actually occurred outside cities and not in the ceremonial itself of the auto de fe. However, Martinez argues the execution rate of the Inquisition was not as high as previously believed, especially when compared to secular tribunals in Spain and broader Europe. And in fact, most sinners were burned in effigy. That's something that uh, Gitlitz corroborates in his book, that many of the first and second wave uh, were burned in effigy, while some Sephardic Jews actually even fled Mexico City and, uh, and went back to Spain or, or to Europe um, for that matter. Still, the most extreme punishments were reserved for conversos and moriscos. The same process applied to conversos in New Spain, especially after the establishment of the Inquisition in Mexico, including the Fonsecas and Carvajals. And so over time, Spaniards in colonial Mexico eventually linked the concept of limpieza de sangre to physical appearance, especially due to the presence of Indians, Africans, and Asians. And this mestizaje, or the mixing, intermixing of various racial and ethnic groups and in fact, uh, in the 18th century, the idea of mestizaje coincides with the uh, scientific racism, if you will, and mestizaje, which referred to the, um, the mixing, um, uh, breeding of uh, various animals and uh, seeds uh, taken from the new world. And so then, um, limpieza de sangre, went from being mainly associated with having old Christian ancestry to being connected to whiteness, a link that Martinez says became stronger in the 18th century when the genre of art known as casta paintings, as you see uh, here in, in the slide, became more prominent 
and depicted 16 basic portraits that are on display in the National Anthropology Museum in Mexico City. The Holy Office of the Inquisition in Mexico was finally abolished in 1820 on the eve of Mexican independence from Spain. And so what is the significance? Why bother learning Sephardic Jewish history? It really is part of this broader story of immigration and settlement in Mexico and the United States across time and space, including right here in Texas and the American West. For example, the book Pioneer Jewish Texans. But we also learn, for example, in the case of Texas, um, the Galveston movement and the arrival of Jews from Eastern Europe in the early 20th century. And you have this dichotomy of pioneers and refugees, which is at once celebratory, yet also stories of segregation and discrimination, even in the American West, uh, as you'd find in, uh, in Mexico or New Spain. And it's also a story of overcoming obstacles, hardships that uh, immigrants had to endure and overcome, which, which applies to many groups. And so then we also think about this broader Jewish diaspora of refugees and immigration across the globe, especially Ashkenazi Jews of Central and Eastern Europe. The first time I actually even heard about Sephardic Jews was back in 1999 when I visited the Holocaust Museum of El Paso and learned not only about the Holocaust, but also Dr. Stanley Hord's dissertation about the Mexican Inquisition. And so it got me to, th to uh, thinking about the origins of anti-Semitism in the uh, Hispanic world and which and coincidentally, 1999 was when I entered the PhD program at SMU in Dallas, and I ended up taking a class on uh, medieval Spain with Dr. Jeremy Adams, and my historiographical paper looked at those origins of anti-Semitism. And let's see, then the next slide, another reason, well, um, I give a shout out here to my colleague, Dr. Edward B. Westerman, our Regents Professor of History who uh, just came out with a, his latest book, Drunk on Genocide, Alcohol and Mass Murder in Nazi Germany. In 2016, Dr. Westerman published a book called Hitler's Ostkrieg and the Indian Wars, comparing genocide and conquest. And it's, it's very telling that in Hitler's Ostkrieg, Dr. Westerman draws comparisons with the Spanish conquest and the rise of the so-called black legend against Spanish colonization in the new world. And so when I have, whenever I hear my colleague, Dr. Westerman, discuss the Holocaust, I cannot help but think about the Spanish Inquisition. And so in a very comparative sense, we get this, um, this greater interest in Holocaust and genocide. And another reason, simply our own identity, as Hispanics, and that there are Hispanic Jews in the Hispanic world, especially people who are interested in uh, genealogy of their own families and doing all sorts of uh, this DNA testing. In my case, um, in the summer of uh, 2018, I uh, took the wife and kids to uh, finally visit my uh, mom's family in Spain, and in, we took a uh, a bus tour uh, from Madrid to Toledo. And on the way over the bus, which is pictured here uh, in this uh, image, uh, made a stop, a uh, pit stop, if you will, not really a gas station, but definitely a gift shop of souvenir ceramics. And then it had the name Galan, which kind of surprised me because I don't normally uh, see that anywhere. And inside the store, um, as it turned out, I went up to the front, uh, the front uh, cashier to uh, pay for some souvenirs that the children wanted. And I asked uh, the person there, um, you know, who was the uh, owner? And he goes, I am. And he was Galan. Uh, but we just didn't have the time because the, our guide said we had to get back on the bus. But uh, you can imagine for me how much I wanted to be able to talk to him because 
Um, before my, my father had passed away some years ago, he had told me that he believed our last name, Galan, was originally Jewish uh, back in Spain. And so uh, the interest continues. But inside the walls of Toledo, you can see um, these very thick walls that kind of uh, remind you of the, the medieval nature of uh, castles, if you will. But inside the walls, uh, there is um, an area that's referred to as the Jewish section. And they have these markers on the side of the wall or sometimes on, on just on the, the street itself um, that uh, are, are reminders that there was this Jewish presence. Uh, there's also signage on the side of buildings to the old uh, Jewish, uh, the old synagogue. And you can see this picture that I took of the interior and uh, very, very beautiful inside. Um, off to the left in this picture is uh, our tour guide. And um, I remember asking our tour guide, um, you know, so where is the, the Jewish community? And he just kind of turned to me matter of factly and just said, well, there really aren't any Jews left in Toledo, which I thought was interesting. And, and uh, nearby, there was some signage that showed uh, Jewish surnames uh, in Toledo. And so there are all these names that were listed there. And it, in 2012, 10 years ago, the government of Spain published a list of surnames to consider granting citizenship to the descendants of Sephardic Jews, but under two conditions that for those who are Jewish and that are members of an organized community. And um, a few years later, uh, there, was, there were more names added to what appears on this uh, um, signage. And among the names, uh, it turns out that uh, Galan was also uh, listed. Um, and so then you see signage referring to a Sephardic museum. You see uh, there was an exhibit, a Sephardic a Jewish exhibit. But you also see in the local stores, the gift shops, um, just the selling of uh, souvenirs. Um, and I thought this image here, the photos that I took here, one that is Jewish and one of this Christian, that is also very telling because it is also part of the tourism industry, if you will, in trying to um, uh, reveal some story of Toledo's past and it's a Jewish um, uh, past, uh, but at the same time, um, it's almost as if we're, we, we, uh, we visit uh, Spanish sites, uh, whether they be missions or otherwise, and not uh, realize that, um, you know, the Indians are still around. And so you have any number of reasons for wanting to look at Sephardic Jewish history, especially from my perspective, comparative. But to bring it to a conclusion, um, I wanted to end with a couple quotations. The first one from David Gitlis's book, in which he says, stories of Sephardic Jews and their families recall the saga of other Jews across the vast landscapes and timescapes of the diaspora. Members of a tribal minority searching for a home, striving to make a living, and struggling with very mixed success to resist the pressures, both coercive and seductive, to assimilate to the dominant religious culture. And then the second quote from Alejandro Bayer, remembering the Holocaust while keeping alive the memory of Sefarar, including the Inquisition's centuries long persecution of conversos is not only an apt tribute to the victims of both tragedies, but it may also help to illuminate the present. Thank you very much. And so I will go ahead and uh, end my screen and then end my viewing and stop sharing. So let me come back here and I will turn it back to, uh, to Sylvia and to Morgan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Galan. That was a very, very informative and awesome uh, presentation on the uh, Sephardic Jewish history. It was very, very, informative, really, really liked it. I don't see any questions on the chat. Does anyone have any questions? 
Morgan, Oops. Morgan, it doesn't look like there's any questions on the chat. Are there any questions at the Landa Library? Yep, I'm working on collecting one. Give me just a minute. Okay, sure. Was Okay. Um, Dr. Gallon, I have a question here from someone at Lambda wondering about if you know anything about um, the Inquisition in Brazil. Oh, that's a, uh, a good question. Um, uh, no, no, I do not. Um, but uh, because of that Portuguese, uh, Spanish borderlands, um, you know, I'm very interested in, 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 uh, in Brazil. I haven't taught a class just separately on Brazil's history uh, because it's usually, I incorporated in with the teaching of, uh, of Latin America, mostly Span uh, Spanish colonies, uh, but that would be worth uh, more investigation actually. Thank you for the question. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I have um, maybe more of a comment. Okay. I was very uh, very much interested in your in your talk, uh, and uh, I uh, what what I remember it's not really connected to the migration, but I am from France. You hear my accent, and I. Uh, met a Sephardi, a family who lived in Algeria. Hmm. And they had to leave Algeria when it began its independence. They had to flee for their lives, so they uh, crossed the Mediterranean over to France. And uh, he was, uh, and this uh, family uh, talked to us, and it was interesting how uh, they were trying to explain to me the Sephardi uh, a viewpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, the reason that they left Algeria was the revolution and the Arabs would kill them if they had stayed there. And, uh, and he was telling us the, the difference between Sephardi and Ashkenazi and I uh, find out that we came to the United States and San Antonio, and we met and a Sephardic couple. And uh, the main difference I saw that was fascinating in the celebration of Passover. Hmm. Yeah, Where, that's. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say just the fact that you mentioned uh, the, these people that you mentioned who had left uh, Algeria um, with the revolution there and against uh, French rule. Um, wow. you're, you reminded me of, of something my father told me when he left Cuba uh, with my mother in the early 60s and went to, to Spain. And he was he, he remembers years later walking the streets of Madrid and he ran into an old friend of his and he gave him a, an abrazo, a big hug. And um, and, and they were both happy that, you know, they were, they were living, um, you know, they, they were, they were able to see each other again. My dad told me that, that this individual was, was Jewish. Uh, he was Jewish Cuban and that the family had actually uh, left Russia in the 1930s and they left Russia, the Stalinist purges there and then traveled to Cuba. And then uh, they had to, they had to leave again. Um, so it's really interesting. The story that you share seems to just really kind of uh, uh, resonate with stories, perhaps of, of lots of Sephardic Jews throughout the world and other Jews that we might not even think about, for example, that had gone into the to the Ottoman Empire. Um, but I'm sorry, uh, uh, Micheline, I, I, yeah. I interrupted you. <laughs> No, 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 uh, you did not, I was about finished, and okay. your comment is uh, very, very interesting. Thank Dr. you for sharing. Thank you so much. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Galan, uh, something yes. has to come up on the chat. Someone was asking about, what about the common language of the Sephardic Jews, something like Ladrino? Oh, wow. Well, um, you know, 
that that's a good question as well um the, what i what i what i would recommend is um there's a uh there's a documentary that came out not too long ago and and maybe uh mr huddleston um i don't know if you've seen it or some of our other listeners but there's a documentary called uh Re remember remember my soul and it talks about um Sephardic Jews in, in South Texas and talking about their contributions to customs and culture. So uh, they were really looking at uh, or talking to people in Brownsville. But it is interesting that, uh, for example, my wife is from Laredo and you have um, a number of uh, Jews who live in Laredo and you have other parts of Mexico in which you cannot help, but there's this, uh, there might be this common language um, in, that is like uh, Ladino that referring to say Hispanization, if you will. Um, but that's a, that's a really good question and have to look into that further. There is another comment um, and it's, uh, it said, whoops, it just moved. It says, um, oh. I highly recommend Howard Shark's book, Farewell España, the world of Sephardim remembered. Oh, wow. So that sounds great. And there's another comment. Is there a question? Is there evidence of the Sephardic Jews in Mur or Rivera or Camargo near Texas, Mexico border? Surname Lopez in our family tree. Oh, that that's interesting. Um, it's possible. Um, I know that for some of the descendants of the original Spanish and Mexican land grant families, um, you also have De La Garza and you have Lopez and you have other names that uh, tend to be associated with the Sephardic Jews. And um, so uh, it's possible because those towns um, really like Laredo established in the mid 18th century um, under uh, the Escandon expedition. Um, but uh, but it's possible that you have names there as well. Okay. Good there, question. There is another uh, comment and they're asking, Dr. Long, would your presentation or a version of it be available to share with us? And the thing is we are recording this. The San Antonio mm -hmm. Public yeah. Library is recording it and it will be available. So, and the person is saying, I'm interested in continuing to learn more about this topic as it relates to some of my family ancestry. Right. And someone says the language is Ladino. Right. Um, there is also someone is saying that there is a program called Ladino Day oh, wow. taking place in New York City on January the 30th. Oh, um, awesome. So that is interesting. Thank you for letting us know about that. Yeah, especially um, uh, Sarah, Sarah and Sarah's comment uh, and Ron's uh, comment that uh, go back to um, uh, Frank Huddleston's uh, question about common language and Ladino. Are there any more questions? Yeah, um, Sylvia and Dr. Galan have uh, one question from a, a person here at Landa. So uh, Dr. Galan, do you know how many people or roughly how many people took Spain up on their offer um, to return to Spain? Um, the person is saying that they, it's their understanding that in order to go back to Spain, you had to give up your current citizenship. Just wondering if you um, knew any information about that. No, supposedly that program just recently ended and um, it might have been geared towards especially um, Sephardic Jews uh, in the Middle East. Um, but, uh, but to my understanding, um, I, I, I was thinking it, of it in terms of dual citizenship, like we have uh, with Mexico and the United States, for example. Um, but don't quote me uh, on that, um, because that's something that you would definitely want to uh, to verify. Um, and uh, and so um, just just that whole notion, for my purposes, of offering uh, this uh, citizenship. Uh, 500 years, you know, more than 500 years after the expulsion um, is just quite fascinating because it also speaks to 
uh, the question of apologies for the Spanish conquest over the indigenous peoples. And so there's this kind of uh, parallel um, uh, working here um, that offers some really cool comparative history. But thank you uh, for that question. Um, okay, anything else that any other questions that any folks might have? Uh, someone is saying there are wonderful songs and liturgical music from the Ladino culture. Mm -hmm. No additional That's, questions here at Lambda. No more questions. Go ahead, Dr. Gallon. No, I was just going to say, and that was coming from Sarah again, who was making reference to the Ladino language. Okay. Okay, sorry, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yes, um, just wanted to just tell you, thank you so much. Uh, that was brilliant. There are lots of uh, very interesting information. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Galan. And um, if anyone else has anything else? Uh, someone, oh, someone just put try Yazim and they're questioning the spelling Levy's songs. Thank you, Les. Okay, anything else? Anything else, Morgan? Uh, nope, other than uh, Dr. Galan, can you stay on for just a few minutes after we wrap up the okay. presentation? Um, I have someone here at Lando that has some more detailed questions. So, um, all right. Yep. So, if you wouldn't mind staying on, but Thank yeah, you. Other, other than that, okay. Thank you. Um, hold on just a moment. We have an additional comment. Go ahead. Yeah, that what you were talking about with England and Portugal and Spain and all the countries in Europe reminds me of what someone once told me is I guess it's sort of a joke where some American asked a Jewish person, Where is your family from? and his reply was, Which century? Hmm. <laughs> were you able to hear that? that. Uh, I, a little bit, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so just the joke about, you know, folks that are from so many different places getting the question of, uh, you know, where is your family from, uh, and the answer being which century, uh, um, you know, just getting <laughs> yeah. that some folks, uh, you know, that in a lot of cases our, our family heritage is so diverse that answering the question um, where is your family from is, is, can be a complex one for sure. Yeah. Definitely. So yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, no, otherwise nothing else here. So yes, thank you so much, um, Dr. Lalonde for your presentation tonight. It was very, very interesting. So really appreciated thank it. Thank you very much, Morgan and thank Sylvia. You. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you everyone for joining us for uh, the Holocaust Learn and Remember. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Galan.